Okay, so let me introduce you to a old place you probably never heard of, the Americas. Patent pending, of course. You may know it as the land of the free and home of, well, oh, the, uh, you know the thing. Or at least the top part, I mean. You see, all the way back in the 13th century, the United States, Canada, Mexico, and all the rest of what we know as North America were still unfounded. The largest region where people lived at the time was Mexico and Peru, with the Incas and Aztecs respectively. At this point in history, North and South America weren't separated as they are today. So what played a huge role at this point of history? Well, beans, you know, the magical fruit. In the year 1200, beans started to become a really big deal, along with corn. No, not that type of corn. Stupid! You're so stupid! This type of food was started in the eastern woodlands and became a very big part of living there and the cultures that surrounded it. The eastern woodlands would later become part of the eastern United States and Canada. Also around this time, the Okoma, Pueblo, and Middle Mississippian cultures started and showed how strong of a cultural grasp they had. This was also the time when the Incan Empire dominated parts of the Andes Mountains in South America. The Incan Empire was more of a united monarchy and scared humans which differentiated them from the Aztecs. They also had several other economic differences. The most interesting part of their culture was that they never had a real written language. Instead, they used something called Quipu, which was a numerical system involving knotted strings to communicate. Meanwhile, Gahokia, North America's first city, ended its peak at one point even having a larger population than London. I'll go into more detail here, but I gotta catch a ride on my industrial grade pogo stick, so I'll let my next editor take over from it. Take it away, Johnny. Um, I'm not Johnny, but let's take a look at Africa. Beginning of the 13th century, as Africa continues to grow, the production of churches grows as well. Ethiopia creates a group of 11 churches carved from the rocks of the Lhasa Mountains. 1230, Sindhi Adakaida was acknowledged as the creator and ruler of the Mali Empire. Soon the empire was passed down to Sindhi Adda's great nephew, Mansa Musa. 1250, Mamluk slaves in Egypt overthrow the Ayyubid dynasty and succeed in making their own Mamluk dynasty. The military dictatorship controlled Egypt for 250 years. 1260, the city of gold, Timbuktu, becomes a part of the Mali Empire. Due to Timbuktu being located near river routes, it becomes a hot spot for trading and quickly becomes the most important trading city in all of Sudan. 1280, after the death of Mali ruler Abu Bakar, a former slave known as Sakura seizes the throne as the sixth Mansa. Mansa Sakura brought the deteriorating empire back together and becomes a well-liked ruler. Europe in the 13th century was a time to open itself up to the world and a time to change. There were the Crusades, but also the development of cities and universities. For example, in 1200, Sicily represented an area where various cultures and civilizations were found. This was a place where the Latin Germanic, Muslim, and the Byzantine empires collide. Sicily was a hub for diversity and multiculturalism. Friedrich II became king of Sicily from 1194 to 1250. His mother was a Sicilian Norman and his father was German. This made Friedrich a very unique and most progressive leader that expressed two different worlds. He was interested in other cultures and spoke six languages. He encouraged artists, scientists, and writers. In 1210, Francis of Assisi started his own religious order. Francis was a monk who rejected his father's wealth to walk barefoot with the poor and live in nature. Francis became a radical monk where he dedicated his life to poverty, humility, simplicity, and anti-materialism. In 1220, fresco painting became popular. There was a change in the religious Italian architecture that left more wall space that demanded suitable decoration. Fresco painting is a process of painting on wet lime plaster, using colors ground and mixed with lime water. As the colors dried, they became fixed. We don't know who discovered this technique of fresco painting, but we do know that this technique was slightly problematic 
as it did not survive with the climate. In 1277, Giotto de Bondone was born, soon to be one of the great Italian masters of paint. His figures are volumetric rather than linear, and the emotions they express are varied and convincingly human rather than stylized. He created a new kind of pictorial space with an almost measurable depth. Sweden. By the mid-13th century, the civil wars were drawing to an end. The most important figure in Sweden at that time was Berger Jarl, magnate of the Folkung family. The Jarls organized the military affairs of the eastern provinces and commanded the expeditions abroad. Berger was appointed Jarl in 1248 by the last member of the family of St. Eric, Eric Erikson, to whose sister he was married. Berger's eldest son, Valdemar, was elected king when Eric died, 1250. Norway. The Norse king's options were limited. Winter was approaching. His supplies were low and his men were getting restless. He agreed to disperse the fleet and spend the winter in Orkney. He would return in the spring to have his bloody revenge on Alexander. But Hekon did not see the spring. He died in Orkney on 16th of December, 1263. He was the last Norwegian king to mount a military assault on Scotland. Scandinavia. From the 1280s onward, large-scale wars had broken out. The murder of Eric V of Denmark, for instance, caused a protracted conflict between the Danes and the Norwegians, who had given refuge to the alleged murderers. Scotland, 22nd July, 1298, Battle of Falkirk. Incensed by the news of his army's defeat at the Battle of Stirling Bridge, Edward I of England, who had been preoccupied fighting the French in Flanders, returned home to march on Scotland. After various setbacks en route, Edward discovered that the Scots were at Calendar, close to Stirling, and seized the initiative. It was the efficiency of the English longbows against the Scottish spearmen which won the day, and it estimated that over 2,000 Scots were killed. With a large number of the survivors having deserted the cause, Sir William Wallace resigned as Guardian of Scotland. During the 13th century, a long and bloody campaign of wars known as the Crusades were in full swing. These holy wars were sanctioned by the Latin Church of Christianity with the intention of liberating the Holy Land of Jerusalem from Islamic rule. At this time in history, the Third Crusade had just failed, and in 1201, Pope Innocent III sanctioned the Fourth Crusade. The Crusade was a messy affair, in which the Crusaders played a part in the sacking of multiple cities, most notably Constantinople. Constantinople was one of the largest and most culturally important cities in history, but especially in this era. The Fourth Crusade resulted in the burning of half of the city, the other half falling prey to plundering. With the amount of ancient statues and holy relics melted down and turned into coin, this is considered to be one of the greatest losses of art in human history. The Fourth Crusade lasted until 1204, but never reached the holy city of Jerusalem. The Latin Empire claimed Constantinople from the Byzantine Empire following the destruction of the Fourth Crusade. The city would spend the next 60 years eroding under Latin rule, with much of its population starving and homeless. In 1261, the Byzantine Emperor Michael Palaiologos VIII managed to recapture the city from the Latin Empire, but by then it hardly resembled the thriving metropolis it once was. The emperor did what he could to restore the city's churches and monasteries, most notably the Hagia Sophia. The Hagia Sophia was an architectural masterpiece filled with ancient relics and mosaics and topped with a massive 182-foot dome. 
the temple still stands today in what is now the city of Istanbul. Constantinople would remain under Byzantine rule for the remainder of the century. Now let's take a look at the Middle East. At this point, the Seljuk power is declining in the Middle East. In Syria, with the previous Seljuk Empire crumbling, Europe attempts to set up Christian states via Crusades. However, these all but fail. In Asia Minor, the independent Sultanate of Rum is founded by a branch of the defunct Seljuk Empire. Now they have become a powerful trade state due to the Crusaders' demand for luxury goods from the East. Kekwabad I, the current ruler, leads the state into a golden age before the Mongol invasion in 1237. Meanwhile, Iran has fragmented into rival principalities that eventually are conquered by the Khwarazm Shah Principality. This short-lived empire that stretched from the borders of India to those of Anatolia did not endure. The Mongol army of Genghis Khan conquered a huge portion of this empire in 1220. The last Khwarazm Shah, Jalal al-Din Mingburnu, was defeated by the Mongols in 1231, and his territories were taken over by them. The Turkish general Saladin's nephew, Al-Adil I, has control of the area known as Egypt. He and his descendants remain in power for most of the 13th century while defending against crusades. In the crumbling state of Iraq, under the Abbasid Caliphate, Baghdad is an important center for learning and book production. The first college of all four schools of Sunni law is built, named Mutan Syria Madrasa. Baghdad has become an important center of Islamic culture. The big story in the continent of Asia during the 13th century was all about the Mongols. In 1206, after uniting the Mongol tribes, Temujin was proclaimed Khan of the Mongol Empire, taking the name Genghis Khan. Under the leadership of Genghis, the Mongols conquer Western Xia and peacefully absorb the Uyghurs into the empire. In 1215, he captures Beijing, and his grandson Kublai Khan is born. This guy will be super important later on. From 1218 to 1227, Genghis directs his effort westward, sweeping through and taking control of the Khwarezm Shah dynasty. His attacks devastated Islamic Central Asia for a time, but eventually led to a greater expansion of the Silk Road, further connecting the Eastern and Western worlds. Genghis died in 1227 and at his request was buried in an unknown location somewhere in Mongolia. Ogadai, Genghis's third son, is formally elected as Khan of the Mongol Empire, and he turns his father's headquarter at Karakorum into a capital city. The Mongols conquer the Korean Peninsula. One of Genghis's grandsons, Batu Khan, and his Mongols sweep into Russia, where they and their descendants become known as the Golden Horde. It is said that around this time, handheld firearms in the form of hand cannons start appearing in battles. Kublai Khan is elected Great Khan of the Mongols. During this time, there was infighting amongst the various descendants of Genghis Khan. Famed explorer Marco Polo was 17 years old when he set off for Asia with his father and uncle. The adventures from this trip were later documented in the book that made him famous, The Travels of Marco Polo. Kublai Khan chooses a name for his new dynasty in China, calling it Ta Yuan, Great Origin. The Mongols attack Japan for the first time and do not do well. Kublai Khan moves the Mongol capital to what is now Beijing. Marco Polo is presented to Kublai Khan in Xanadu, and according to his own account, makes a very good impression. The last holdouts from the Song Dynasty are eradicated, and Kublai Khan takes control of a united China. Beijing becomes, for the first time, the capital of China. The Mongols attack Japan a second time, and do even worse than the first time. Kublai Khan dies, and is succeeded by his grandson Timur. The Yuan Dynasty ruled well into the late 14th century. Southeast Asia in 1215 CE. The Khmer Empire is at the height of its power, and the great temple of Angkor Wat has been built. What is happening in Southeast Asia in 1215 CE? Malay Kingdoms. The Sri Vijaya Empire has vanished, to be replaced by numerous kingdoms in Malaya, Java, and Sumatra. The Khmer Empire 
The dominant power in the region is now the Khmer Empire, which is based in Cambodia, but has conquered the historic kingdom of Champa and has expanded over a huge empire. This is the age in which the great series of Khmer temples were built, culminating in Angkor Wat, by all measures one of the most spectacular buildings ever constructed anywhere in the world. Burma In Burma, the Burman Kingdom of Pagan has now expanded, conquering the Mon Kingdom to the south. Unsurprisingly, other Muslim leaders decided to take advantage of this situation, and at the end of the 12th century, Muhammad of Gore, whose family had replaced that of Muhammad of Ghazni as the rulers of Afghanistan, began a systematic conquest of the subcontinent. By the time of his death in 1206, Muhammad's armies had conquered a large part of northern India. The Slave Generals Islamic teachings spread to Southeast Asia around the 13th century. The basic teaching of Islams are contained in the Quran. Islam changed people's ordinary lives. Pork, which is a ritual food in Southeast Asia, was forbidden to Muslims and people were forced to stop eating it. Now let's see what was happening in Oceania during the 13th century. Oceania is a region made up of thousands of islands throughout the Central and South Pacific Ocean. Around 1215, Polynesian colonists from Tahiti discovered New Zealand. And giant statues known as Moai were beginning to be built on Easter Island. These massive stone works were built starting around the 13th century by the Rapa Nui, an ancient Polynesian society that later collapsed mysteriously. The Moai are the product of competitive building between chiefs. Each chief sought to attain higher status by building larger statues. Meanwhile, up north in Japan, we find ourselves in the Kamakura Shogunate, a military government founded by Minamoto no Yoritomo in 1185. Legally, the shogunate was under the control of the emperor, and the shogun controlled the military. But controlling the military became tantamount to controlling the country, and the emperor in Kyoto was basically just a symbol of sovereignty. The Kamakura period dominates the 13th century of medieval Japan and lasts from 1185 to 1333, with a series of shoguns and quote-unquote emperors. As we've already seen, the Mongols had a big impact on the 13th century world, and they made two attempts to invade Japan in 1274 and 1281. Lucky for Japan, these invasions were thwarted by Japanese warriors and the aid of the Divine Wind, or kamikaze of typhoons that destroyed the Mongol fleet. However, the financial strain of defending against the Mongol attacks exacerbated internal weaknesses in the shogunate regime. 